Good morning from our global headquarters in New York. I'm Danny Berger. Manish Cranny is off. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Doubting the cuts, a string of hotter U.S. data pushes 10-year yields beyond 4.1%. Pressing Netanyahu, President Biden says it's time for a ceasefire in Gaza after Israel kills the leader of Hamas. And a big tech bonanza. Sales of Apple's newest iPhone soar in China. Netflix earnings blow through estimates. The story yesterday was one of stronger data. It made the S&P 500 lose momentum. But the momentum seemingly back this morning. S&P 500 futures up to tenths of a percent. Nasdaq 100 leads after signs that Apple sales of their iPhone in China up 20 percent year over year. For this bond market, 10-year yields creeping ever so slightly higher, just one and a half basis point this morning, pushing above 4.1 percent. That is the highest level for your 10-year yield since August. Gold also at another record, 2700 and six dollars. So after the Fed's 50 ba basis point cut, we've just had weeks of strong data. First, it started with that hot jobs report. CPI then comes above expectations, completing the trifecta with solid retail sales yesterday that showed resiliency. All of this led to the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now tracker moving to 3.4 percent. That is the highest so far of this quarter. Joining us now is Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for international economics. Adam, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You've been saying for some time for having me. that the Fed is not going to be able to cut as much as most have thought. With this recent strong data in hand, Adam, how likely is it that we won't get any cuts for the rest of this year? Oh, I think we're going to get a cut in November and almost certainly a cut in December, Danny, 25 each. There'll be some more dissents maybe, and it'll be a three-way vote, uh, which is unusual for the Fed. But or if Powell wants to prevent that, he may skip December. The issue is more that Powell and a lot of the FOMC were guiding or accepting markets pricing in continued cuts further in 2025. And that, where I, you and I have been talking over the last few months, that's not going to happen. Right. So 2025, we won't get as many cuts as the market has been guiding. Adam, I still really want to understand the risk of a hike, because this is something you've been really good on, that there is this risk of a hike in 2025. How soon could that appear? I think it has to wait until March or April at the earliest, because it will be heavily dependent, Danny, on the budget of the federal government. Uh, essentially, part of what the Fed and most market expectations are is that you'll have a split Congress, and that split Congress will stymie budget expansion, further deficits, and so on. I don't think that's right. I mean, you may get a split Congress, but I don't think that either a Harris or a Trump administration is going to end up doing uh, no change in fiscal policy. If anything, it'll get bigger deficits, especially under Trump. So I think by June, especially if it's Trump, there's a good chance the Fed is hiking. But I feel by April, it's going to be very clear they're not cutting. Adam, I want to get more into the politics and the uh, consequences of them in just a moment. But just taking a step back and, and a bigger view, this is an economy that keeps surprising us to the upside. It has been the consistent theme for 2024, even since last December, with the large amount of cuts that are get, getting priced in. And again, at every turn, it is a stronger economy. Adam, why do we keep getting this wrong? What are we missing? There's a getting the economics wrong and there's a failure to reprice. <laughs> um, so you got two things going on. I think the failure to reprice is in part due to the Fed. The Fed has not been communicating in a way that suggests that there were risks on both sides. I mean, by last spring and certainly by the summer, the Fed was very loudly saying almost all the risks were on the unemployment side and on the downside. In terms of getting the economy wrong, I feel like people have given short shrift to how much of a boost we got from productivity and inward migration. And they just, for some reason, kept discounting any labor market data that wasn't the unemployment series. And both of those, I think, were bad ways to do your forecast. Well, Adam, that brings us to the politics of it all, because as you point out, there is a risk of curtailing immigration, not just curtailing it, but 
but deporting folks to in a Trump presidency. You had this great piece in Foreign Affairs magazine this morning. Let me just read it to our audience, the title of which, The True Dangers of Trump's Economic Plans. Any short-term benefits gained by driving a hard bargain in bilateral negotiations or in a given industry would be vastly outweighed by the macroeconomic costs of generating uncertainty. Adam, you mentioned why people don't think this is the case, the idea of a split Congress. Maybe Trump surrounds himself right. with smarter people, and therefore this isn't as big of a risk. Right. Why are some of those softenings of concerns about Trump wrong? I mean, it's again, it's a matter of forecasting, even though it is political, Danny. And, and the fact, a couple key facts. First point is, there's never been a president who's come in, elected, had a program that he said he wanted or she wanted to do, and then not pursued it. It literally has not happened, at least not in the last 100 years. So the idea that, oh, they're just politicians and he's just talking is completely out of experience. Second, we know from Trump himself, even though the policies he did during Trump 1.0 or his first term were nowhere near as bad as what he's proposing to do, he did carry them all out and he stuck with them, whether it was tax cuts that didn't generate growth and revenues, whether it was a China trade deal that made no difference to the China trade balance. He stuck with them just throughout even when the evidence went the other way. And then the third point, and this is the key point, is there are a lot of smart people or people who think they're smart who say, oh, this is all just a negotiating tactic. Trump is just gonna say these things and force the Democrats in Congress or force the Chinese or the Russian or the Japanese or the German government to cave in. The problem is that might work in certain situations in foreign policy where you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with somebody who controls an army or controls a government. But in markets, you're dealing with millions upon millions of people. And so even if you get the government you're sitting across the table from to concede, you're creating uncertainty. That's the quote you kindly read. And that has spillovers. It's like poison gas. If you launch it on your enemies across the battlefield, it may just blow back on you. And by the time they end up launching poison gas at you, I mean, I hate to use this image, but I mean, either way, your troops themselves get constrained, get worn down, get demoralized. In the end, it's not enough to act sophisticated and say, oh, it's just a negotiating tactic, because the threats have to be credible. And perversely, if all the big investors say, well, Trump's not really going to do this, it's more likely he's going to have to deport a bunch of people, more likely he's going to have to put on tariffs, because otherwise his threats are empty and they'll be ignored. Adam, I think you point out something that people often forget about the first pr Trump presidency, that policy was kind of handed down through Twitter at the time. It was often confusing and often disjointed. You've already seen things like Qualcomm delaying any talks with Intel about a takeover because they want to wait for the presidential election. In this economic cycle, if, with the Fed cutting, if we do get this era, this era of uncertainty, what do you expect in terms of business plans, how the business community reacts? Will there be Something of a slowdown, less spending, less plans being made because of this uncertain environment? Absolutely, Danny. And again, I mean, you, there are things the Democrats can do. I mean, part of what Qualcomm is reacting to is the antitrust mm -hmm. policies that the Democrats are talking about putting in place. So, you know, there are more than one factor. But you're absolutely right that the fundamental issue is if you have a government that's busy making threats, that's busy constraining the supply side of the U.S. economy, letting us have less workers, less inputs, less consumer goods, less foreign funding of our debt, that's scary to business. And so, no, it's not capital flight, we're not Argentina, but the U.S. then would have fewer deals, less investment at home, and less growth. Adam. You're in Berlin. I just want to end it on Europe and not unrelated to this. Europe not only facing a weaker economy, inflation below 2 percent, but also the threat of tariffs, the threat of trade disruption of Trump. Could it be in a year's time we're talking about serious disinflation and weakening growth in Europe? I think it could be, especially since the places that are already weak this year, notably Germany, um, are some of the ones that are most vulnerable to further trade tensions. This is why we see the split amongst the Europeans on how to approach the issue of Chinese EVs. I think in the end, it, it'll work out better for Europe than perhaps for the US, and that's what our simulations show, because Europe will gain, frankly, at the US expense in terms of trade opportunities, investment opportunities, capital flows, if the U.S. is busy messing itself up, as it would be if Trump gets in and does what he says he's going to do. 
Hey, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time out of your Europe trip to talk with us. We'll we're going to have to leave it there. Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Wonderful, as always. Okay, let's get you some other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Sales of Apple's latest iPhone are up 20% in China in their first three weeks versus the 2023 model. Data from CounterPoint Research shared with Bloomberg show that consumers are still shifting to the pricier models. The top end Pro and Pro Max are up 44% versus their predecessors. Data this morning showed a deepening slowdown in China last quarter. Minutes after that release, the PBOC shared more details of its measure to boost capital markets, signaling that Beijing intends to continue its stimulus push. Separately, the PBOC governor flagged real estate and the stock market as key economic challenges requiring policy support, and thus you see China equities rally into the close. Netflix beat expectations last quarter, delivering 5 million new subscribers and surpassing Wall Street estimates on every major financial metric. The streaming giant saw sales grow 15%, despite a programming slate constrained by last year's strikes in Hollywood. Many analysts think that Netflix, though, is just riding a boost from cracking down on password sharing, which will only be temporary. Coming up, Israel kills the leader of Hamas. President Biden calls for the conflict to wind down. We're going to bring you the latest out of the Middle East. And markets rolling back their rate cut bets. We're going to discuss with Kashi Jones of Charles Schwab. Stick around with us for that conversation later in the hour. It's your Bloomberg Brief on this Friday morning. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Israel says it will continue fighting the war in Gaza even after the death of the Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. Here's what Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had to say. I'm standing before you today to inform you that Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar has been eliminated. The person who committed the most terrible massacre in the history of our nation since the Holocaust, the mass murderer who murdered thousands of Israelis and kidnapped hundreds of our citizens, was eliminated today by our heroic soldiers. And today, as we promised to do, we settled the account with him. Today, evil has suffered a heavy blow, but the task before us is not yet complete. President Biden, meanwhile, wants the killing to provide an off-ramp for the conflict that has raged on for over a year. And further that, uh, now's the time to move on. Move on, move toward a ceasefire in Gaza. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Middle East Breaking News editor, Patrick Sykes. Patrick, how likely does it seem, as Biden wants, that the killing of Hamas's leader could get us closer to a ceasefire? Hi there. Yeah, I think it does bring us closer in that it seems this is probably a prerequisite for Israel to, you know, a target to take out. It's hard to imagine uh, they would have let a resolution happen and that saw him walk, th walk free. But that's not to say it's, it's imminent. You know, you saw in the clip there with, from Netanyahu, he said the task before us is not yet complete. He later said yesterday, this is the beginning of the end. So I think it had to happen from the Israeli perspective militarily in terms of closure after the events of October the 7th. Um, but uh, the fact that, you know, the, the U.S. is leaning on them now so hard uh, just indicates that I think it's not a given that that, that, that will automatically happen. It's going to require some, some hard diplomacy from the U.S. side and it's going to require, I think, some compromises from at least some of the Israeli policymaking community. Patrick, thank you so much for that update. That is Bloomberg's Patrick Sykes in Istanbul. Now, back here in the U.S., we're in the final 18 days before the election. The candidates are making every appearance count as to the ones that they're doing. Democratic nominee Kamala Harris chose not to attend the Al Smith Memorial Foundation dinner last night in New York. Her opponent, Donald Trump, was critical of her absence. My opponent feels like she does not have to be here, which is deeply disrespectful. The last Democrat not to attend this important event was Walter Mondale, and it did not go very well for him. <laughs> he lost 49 states, and he won one. So I said, there's no way I'm missing it. Joining us now for the latest on the race is Bloomberg government's Kate, uh, White House reporter, Kate Ackley. Kate, it's a, it's a weird one, because Harris didn't show up 
to this dinner, as Trump so noted. But Trump has also turned down different interview requests from the likes of 60 Minutes, from CNBC. What do we make of the way that these candidates are picking and choosing the different appearances that they're doing? Well, Vice President Harris did send in a video. So she had an appearance but uh, by a video link. And, um, you know, we know that uh, former President Trump has said he doesn't want to do another debate. So you're right. They're kind of uh, navigating this, deciding to be in battleground states at certain times or take, you know, take time off the cam campaign trail or not. Uh, Vice President Harris was in Wisconsin yesterday uh, while Trump was at this dinner in Manhattan. Kate, how is the outreach going to voters that they see as kind of critical to getting the type of win that, for example, Biden had. And I'm thinking here of Latino voters. We've heard Barack Obama speak explicitly to black men about their need to vote for Kamala Harris. In what ways are the candidates trying to go after these two specific demographics? And have we seen any movement on it? Well, there have been specific policy proposals or at least outlines. Uh, Vice President Harris put out something in recent days that was meant to appeal to um, black men voters. Um, you know, sort of economic and also some other uh, proposals as well. So, you know, you're seeing both campaigns try to appeal to to men voters, Latino voters. Um, I think President, uh, former President Trump said something last night about the, the men that were voting for him at, during the dinner. Um, so you, you see them both trying to appeal to that. But where they're going to be today is in you know the Midwest, the battleground state of Michigan. Trump and Harris will both be there today. It gives you an indication of how important that swing state is in these final weeks. Kate, before we let you go, we were just talking with Patrick Sykes from our uh, bureau chief there on the conflict in the Middle East of Israel killing the Hamas leader and Biden doing this extra push for a ceasefire. How does this change this topic, this contentious issue for this election for the two candidates? Well, Vice President Harris said yesterday at an, a campaign appearance in Wisconsin that this was, you know, the opportunity for this ceasefire to occur. And as your, you know, previous guest and you had the clip from uh, Netanyahu showed it's not necessarily going to be immediate. There's not, uh, you know, immediate agreement that it would end. Um, but that was what that was her uh, point yesterday. And we'll see how this goes over the coming. Uh, did, did you say it was 18 days? But who's counting? <laughs> who's counting? 18 days, Kate. Somehow it's here. It's almost here. It's wild. Kate Ackley of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Okay, it's 5.20 a.m. here in New York, S&P 500 futures. After a day where they just ever so slightly sank into the close or heading higher this morning, two-tenths of 1%, led by tech, led by Apple. Sales of their iPhone 16 up 20% versus last year in China. Your dollar, that is weaker this morning, down two-tenths of 1%, with treasuries higher yet again, up a basis point. We're just above 4.1%. It's been a string of hotter data. It's been repricing, but it's also been good for risk. IG spreads at their tightest since 2005. Bank of America notes in their flow show this morning that cash is coming out and it's going into both bonds and stocks. Okay, coming up, President Trump blames Ukrainian President Zelensky for the war with Russia. We're going to have your front page news next on your Bloomberg Brief. It's your Bloomberg Brief. Danny Berger here in New York. Let's get you some front page news, a look at what's making headlines around the world. Starting off with the Washington Post, they have this, that Trump says Zelensky should never have let that war start. Former President Trump called the Ukrainian president one of the greatest salesmen he's ever met and said that war's a loser. Trump was speaking in a podcast interview. Next up, the Financial Times says that the U.S. charges Indian official over thwarting New York assassination plot. Federal prosecutors charged a man with trying to orchestrate from abroad 
an assassination on U.S. soil. That charge comes days after Canada expelled six Indian officials and accused them of working to target South Asians on Can Canadian so soil. rather. And in the New York Times, in Germany, Biden is preparing for a farewell visit to a key ally. Biden will meet with Chancellor Schultz in what would be the last Europe trip of his presidency. He'll also be meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron and UK Prime Minister Starmer in a multilateral meeting. Here's some of the images of him and the president of Germany. Biden will also be receive, receiving the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit. That is Germany's highest honor reserve for heads of state. He's only the second U.S. president to receive the award after George H.W. Bush. And again, he is currently there in Germany. Okay, a quick check on your bond market this morning. It's the day after an ECB cut where Christine Lagarde didn't rule out a 50 basis point cut to come. Is it a new pivot to a faster signal? So you can see the difference there. Ten year yields lower in Germany, higher in the U.S. Just barely, we're back below 4.1%. Coming up, three hot economic data prints since the Fed's jumbo cut. We're gonna speak to Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. From our global headquarters in New York, welcome to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger, let's set your agenda. Doubting the cuts, a string of hotter U.S. data pushes 10-year yields beyond 4.1 percent. Pressing Netanyahu, President Biden says it's time for a ceasefire in Gaza after Israel kills the leader of Hamas. And a big tech bonanza. Sales of Apple's newest iPhone soar in China. Netflix earnings blow through estimates. All of that leading to a stronger pre-market session for tech this morning. NASDAQ 100 futures leading the pack up four tenths of 1%. Similarly though, Russell 2000 futures up the same amount. S&P up two tenths of 1%. It was weakening stock momentum heading into the close of yesterday. It's been this push and pull of tech. First TSMC helps boost everything. Then we get stronger data, which sends yields higher, which dampens the rally that we ultimately saw. Here's where your bond market stands this morning. Two year yields, little changed. Little change really across the curve. We've come back down from that 4.1%. We did see, though, 10 year yields hit their richest level since August. Fed funds futures only pricing in now 40 basis points of cuts this year. Gold, you can also see at the bottom of your screen, that is at a record. $2,711 an ounce. Maybe it's on Haven buying. There is Biden calling now for a renewed push for a ceasefire. Meanwhile, we did get the newest flow show from Bank of America. Let me just take you through some of these lines because we have long said that there is this reinvestment risk for this bond market. We're going to catch up with Charles Schwab in just a moment, Kathy Jones there about this. But so many people have said, look, there's a reinvestment risk. Yields are going to be coming down and you're going to miss out if you're not invested. Well, it seems like some people have finally heeded that call. Latest Bank of America flow show showing that cash had the biggest outflow in 12 weeks. Where did it go? It went to both bonds and stocks. Bond funds drew the biggest inflow since October 2020 at $23.2 billion. Gold biggest inflow in 12 weeks at 1.2 billion. Stocks also had some inflows too, but it's notable we finally had bond yields go back to 4%. Out of cash we go and into bonds. So finally people are listening to that. Just the last thing to notice, IG bonds also their biggest 5-week inflow since September 2020. The spread on bonds has gotten so thin. Investment grade bonds yesterday moving to the thinnest spread since 2005. Risk is well and alive in this market, but are we pricing in the odds of a contested election? What will that look like? Just want to point out, we are seeing President Biden speaking in Germany. He is receiving the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit. Uh, you can't see it, unfortunately, because people are blocking him, but he has a little lapel on his uh, jacket there, which is that um, award. It's the highest one that you can receive as a non-citizen of Germany. He he is only the second president. Oh, there you can see it right there. He is only the second president to receive this. The last one was George H.W. Bush. So Biden on his tour, his final tour to Europe of his presidency. Meanwhile, we've heard him again call for a ceasefire uh, with Israel in Gaza after the killing of the leader of Hamas. I just want to take you again to this equity market. 
because I want to show you what's happening pre-market. We've had two pieces of news that are boosting tech stocks this morning. One is Apple. Apple shares uh, pre-market are higher by 1.2% after boosting uh, China sales of their iPhone by 20%. Again, as I mentioned, the big risk perhaps in all of this rally is what happens after the election, what happens after November 5th. And on that, investor Ray Dahlia warned that the U.S. may not see an orderly transition of power after the presidential election. When asked about the chances of the results being disputed, he said, quote, if it's a close Trump loss, I would say it's almost an even probability. Trump wins. It's a different story. If you put the two together, maybe a one in three. All to say that there is an outsized risk of a contested election. Joining us now is Kathy Jones, Chief Fixed Income Strategist at Charles Schwab. Kathy, really wonderful to see you this morning. Look, a lot of digital ink has been spilled about the risk to this equity market if there's a contested election. What do you expect to happen to bond market markets if it's not immediately clear who the next president of the United States will be? Yeah, it's going to be probably volatile, but I, I can't say directionally. I would know which way to go with a contested election. I think for the bond market, the bigger issue is what happens with Congress and with fiscal policy after the election. And that's not going to be known if it's contested. So I would expect a certain amount of volatility. You might even see bonds rally, treasuries rally on a flight to safety as people seek a safe haven away from the turmoil. Uh, really hard to say. Uh, I think we're all prepared for this taking a while, um, one way or another, that it might take a couple of days or even a week. So maybe the market's prepared for that. Uh, really tough to say. Kathy, to that point, we have seen bond volatility pick up in a way that we usually don't ahead of elections. Henry Bassman, the man who created the MOVE index that tracks bond volatility, pointed to this as one of the largest event days that he's seen in his career. You can kind of see it just picking up there. What are you seeing from positioning, from clients, just how much demand there is for protection just around that date in the aftermath itself? Yeah, I think, uh, as you alluded to, you know, investors just really nervous about the election and anything they can do to mitigate that, um, they're, they're going to do. And so I'm not really surprised to see ball pick up and people looking for protection because there's just so many unknowns here, um, not only the presidency, but then, of course, Congress after that. And there's a lot of very close races that, that we'll be following. And it probably has a pretty big impact on fiscal policy. It has a big impact in terms of tariffs and, and, and other policies that might get enacted. So I'm not surprised that people want some, some protection because we just don't know which way it's going to go. Kathy, how does that contrast with the unbridled optimism of corporate credit right now? Investment grade spreads at their tightest since 2005. What's going on with this market? Yeah, I think a number of factors are supporting investment grade corporate credit. Um, one is obviously corporate profits continue to do very, very well and hit record highs. So companies, you know, in, in the investment grade space are in really good shape. Supply and demand uh, has been a factor as well. Um, there's been pretty good issuance, but demand has been really outstripping supply for quite some time. And you don't have a weakness in the economy. So the recent economic numbers have pointed to GDP growth roughly in the 3%, maybe plus area. And so that bodes well for corporate profits going forward and cash flows. So uh, I think a lot of people are looking at the corporate bond market, A, for the appeal of the yields, which are you know 5 percentish or so, uh, and for the fact that we don't have some of the fiscal policy issues affecting the corporate bond market that we have affecting the treasury market. But is it at this point, I understand the optimism now, but I mean, is it, are we just priced to perfection, Kathy? Can spreads realistically get any tighter? Doubtful. Uh, it's <laughs> doubtful. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I suppose in theory they could get tighter. Uh, in theory, they can trade through treasuries, but it, it seems very unlikely that that would happen. But yeah, I think the market is priced for perfection. So you have to expect a certain amount of volatility if you're in, in investment grade corporate bonds. We still think all in yields are attractive. We think the fundamentals are good. But yeah, um, you know, the, the total return possibility unless yields fall is probably lower now just because spread compression isn't going to be there. When it comes to this treasury market, Kathy, especially what we've seen with really strong data, really over the past three weeks. Is it still your assumption that this is a Fed on autopilot that's just going to be delivering cut after cut, 25 basis points maybe now? 
or do we need to expect a pause to come? And what does that say about the path of yields near 4.1% for the 10 year? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a good chance the Fed could pause in November simply because we've now had data that um, contradicts or moves away from the narrative they were working with at the September meeting. So it's a big uh, improvement to the labor market data. Uh, it's mixed. Okay, so we had the payroll numbers come up and unemployment edged down, although some of the other data, uh, such as the quits rate and job openings, not looking as strong. So they may want to pause and just say, let's get a handle on where the labor market is before we take another step. Um, the inflation numbers, I think, are still in their favor, still looking good, still trending down, but PCE this time around isn't likely to be quite as friendly as mm. the last couple of months. So they could take a pause and just kind of sit back and reassess where they are and how fast they should go, or they could move in November because the Fed funds rate is still so high relative to inflation, and then you know take another look in December. We still expect at least one rate cut of 25 basis points between now and the end of the year. Kathy? A joy, as always. Thanks for getting up early for us. That's Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. You're watching Thanks, Bloomberg. Danny. It's Bloomberg Brief on this Friday morning. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Apple is regaining its customers in China. The latest iPhone 16 sales soaring 20% in the first three weeks of its release compared to last year's model. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Charlie Wells. Charlie, break down the numbers for us. Yeah, Danny, I mean, Apple needed this. So their iPhone is their most important product. It brings in half of sales for Apple. And it's something of a gateway drug for the company. You buy the phone, you start buying services and other devices. And China, of course, is the world's largest and most competitive smartphone market. So this is a very positive development for them. And it looks like in these first three weeks, it's been going so strong for the iPhone 16 because they have not had the production snarls that the prior model, the iPhone 15, had. And it also looks like it's operating in a slightly more favorable competitive landscape because last time during the iPhone 15 rollout, they faced a much stiffer head-to-head -head competition from a new Huawei model. So this is all what Apple wants to see right now. Let's see if they can keep that momentum going forward. Charlie, we're speaking with Dan Ives in just a moment. I think he might agree with you on some of those points. So those earnings coming out, coming out October 31st. In the meantime, we've already had Netflix reporting after the bell yesterday. Those shares up nearly 6% so far in the pre-market. Clearly some strength. Where did it come from? Yeah, Danny, so they saw some strength from this sort of tried and true strategy over the past few quarters of clamping down on password sharing and also rolling out that new ad supported layer. So that's something that's been working in the past, but analysts and investors have been really focused on the future, on growth in the future. And they also had a story to tell there. Let's take a listen to what Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos had to say. Let's start with, uh, you know, looking into 2025, we're feeling really good about the business. Um, we had a plan to reaccelerate growth and we delivered on that plan. Uh, you can see that in our 2024 financials. Uh, we expect to deliver 15% revenue growth and six percentage points of operating margin improvement and uh, engagement, which we view as our best proxy for member happiness, uh, because when people watch more, they stick around longer. So that's retention. So, Dana, you heard there that mention of the word engagement, and that is a metric that Netflix really wants to be measured for going forward. And they had some good stats there as well. On their earnings call yesterday, they talked about how the average Netflix user spends two hours per day watching Netflix. I'm not one of those people, but that is a really healthy <laughs> metric for that company. I like how they're like trying to track this message of like customer happiness. I don't know, anything but report subscriber growth going forward, I guess, Charlie. Charlie, thank you so much. Charlie Wells there. Joining us now, as I mentioned, Dan Ives, Senior Equity Analyst at Webbush. Dan, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, so you were here. sitting by hearing Charlie describe the enthusiasm over iPhone 16. You've also just come back from doing some mm -hmm. ch channel checks in Asia. Are you seeing that same sort of enthusiasm over Apple? I mean, this is so consistent with what we've seen. The renaissance of growth has begun for Apple with iPhone 16. I think China, look, that was the biggest issue. That was a headwind. Now it's a tailwind. They have mojo going into the next, I think, six to nine months. And that's why, look, a lot of the bears, they've yelled fire in a crowd theater for the last month. 
But I think they go back into hibernation mode, in our opinion. Well, they've been yelling fire, Dan, because it's a Chinese economy that's been looking weaker. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of competition. And that was the reason so many people have said this launch maybe will disappoint and it doesn't have the full AI capacity. Sure. So why didn't it disappoint? Yeah, well, first, you have 100 million iPhones in China in a window of an upgrade opportunity. I also think the climate there, and we've seen it firsthand, it's definitely much tamer than a year ago where really the U.S.-China cold tech war I think was front and center. The other thing is it's just it's the best product out there. I mean, if you look right now, the new Huawei phone, I'd say that's the equivalent of essentially an iPhone 14. Mm. So when you look at iPhone 16, this is globally going to be the start of an AI-driven super cycle. And again, a lot of those features get rolled out, caught over the next few months. I think it's going to be a monster December quarter. I think that's why six months from now, we're looking at a $4 trillion market cap for Apple. Wait, so are you saying that Apple's going to be able to take market share back from some of the homegrown heroes from the Huawei's of the world? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, they've gained, call it, 300 bips of market share in China over the last 18 months. I think they gain another, call it, 100, 150 bips of market share over the next year. And that's going to be very important because... The chi China is the hearts and lungs of the Apple growth story. And I continue to kind of handhold investors that this is the beginning of a renaissance of growth in Cupertino. And this data just further supports what we've been seeing in Asia firsthand. Dan, we're also a few weeks away from just the big tech earnings in general. Just looking at some of the data from what we've had earnings so far, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, $106 billion in CapEx in first half, almost 50% higher year over year. Most of that going towards NVIDIA and chips. Do you expect this earnings to hear that type of spending continuing at a similar pace? I think for bulls, get the popcorn ready <laughs> as those calls start. Because everything we see, it's going to be a robust tech earnings season. I think Netflix kicked it off. Yeah. It's because of AI. You have a trillion dollars of CapEx. And now, obviously, that's led by godfather of AI, Jensen, NVIDIA. But I think what we see, not just from NVIDIA, but what we're going to see from the hyperscale players, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, I think software is going to be strong across the board, cybersecurity. I think tech rips higher going into year end. Clearly, election, some volatility, white knuckles. But I think uh, 20,000, you know, we're going to be looking at 20K in NASDAQ. That's going to be the conversation over the next three months. So if the bulls are eating popcorn, it sounds like the bears might need something a little bit stronger, considering what you're saying. Okay, but there is this risk of an election, and not just an election, but candidates that seem to have both pursuing antitrust yep. policies. Google's a great example of this, and I know you've written a lot about it. They're under the cloud of the U.S. government trying to break it up. Do we see a Google that's maybe more reticent to spend, to make big CapEx plans, if there is this threat looming over them? Look, in terms of antitrust, and obviously a huge overhang on Google, I mean, we saw a cover in Microsoft late 90s, 2000. Like, that is the precedent. I think Google, they learn from Microsoft's mistakes. They're not going to hold back. I think it actually is the opposite. They will double down. They'll fight this in court for years. There will be business model tweaks. But I believe very low chance of any sort of breakup happening. And I think Google, in my opinion, is probably the, most, the biggest risk reward in terms of as a large cap tech stock. I think 34 hours upside here in terms of what we see just even on some of this antitrust overhang. So, sorry. So, antitrust overhang happens. And unlike... Microsoft, which kind of pulled back after some of the action against them in 2000. You think Google's going to go full force into things like AI and that sort of thing, even with this threat? It's a game of thrones. It's a battle right now in big tech. They can't just hold back because mm. of this. And also look at Apple and others. It's not just Google that's under scrutiny. Gates' biggest regret from Microsoft was holding back spending in that period. Other big tech players have learned there, but we are in a, still a 1995, almost 1996 moment for tech, not a 1999 bubble moment. I think that's what's going to continue to play out going into not just year end, but 2025. What did you make then of the Bloomberg reporting earlier this week that Qualcomm was kind of pumping the brakes on looking at Intel to take it over? until the election happens and uncertainty there. I mean, being tied to Intel, it's a nightmare in Elm Street. So the last thing you want to be in this market is tied to Intel, even on the ASML and everything else. Look at TSMC. Look at Godfather of AI, Jensen, NVIDIA. You want to be tied into the left lane, the Bugattis going 90 miles an hour, not the minivans 45 miles an hour in the right lane. So what, it's just an excuse to kind of back off of Intel? It has nothing to do with politics? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I'm just saying right now, you do not want to be tied to Intel in this market. You mentioned ASML and TSMC. 
It's so funny how this narrative has been so whipsawed this week. ASML comes out and it's doom and gloom and maybe the chip boom isn't as big. TSMC completely blows that narrative out of the water. What do you make of the divergence between the two? Were we just misreading what we heard from ASML? I was shocked just per, when we talked about it. When ASML yeah. hit, that's, that, to me, that's more legacy on chip side related to Intel. The fact that the AI names were down there, I, I mean, that was a gift. You look at TSMC, that's the indicator. And I think, look, right from Asia, demand to supply, 15 to one demand to supply. And I think that is just not just positive for NVIDIA, it's positive for AMD and others. But I think that's why in this market, you gotta be careful in terms of some of the reads. And in this market that is volatile off of some of these things, does that tell you, Dan, that there's still some weak hands in these mm -hmm. stocks, that there's still some nervy investors here that can kind of ex run for the exits on, on signs that, as you point out, might not be as telling as they are. Yeah, I think that's a great question, because I think you're definitely seeing that. Yeah. Any sort of nervousness, some white knuckles, head for the elevators. But what we've seen over the last year and a half, two years, is that a very similar sort of, you know, I think chapter play out. But it is 9 p.m., almost 9.30, in the AI party. That goes to 4 a.m. I'm not saying in the midst the DJ stops playing music, there's right. glass on the dance floor, but this is a party. I think it's, a, it's really unprecedented in the last 40 with years. With lots of popcorn at it. Popcorn is what you get ready for those, <laughs> for, those, for those earnings call with tech coming up. Got it. Boundless ends of metaphor, Dan. So great to have you no, on. Thank you so much great. for joining us. Dan Ives of Webbush, excellent as always. Okay, coming up, we're going to set you up for your trading day. We have some more earnings and more Fed speak. All of that to come here on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day on this Friday. We're going to get earnings from American Express, Procter and Gam Gamble, and Schlumberger are all coming before the bell. Plus, more economic data. U.S. housing starts. That comes at 8:30 a.m. Eastern. From Fed Speak Front, we're going to get Raphael Bostic, Neil Kashkari, and Chris Waller all throughout the day. In terms of individual movers, I mentioned American Express. They're going to have earnings before the market opens. Shares are up 51% year to date. 1.8%. Schlumberier, Jay, also earnings before the market open, as I mentioned, expecting to report the highest th third quarter sales in a decade. Finally, Intuitive Surgical extending post earnings gains up 6.2%. Strong quarter of placements for surgical robot Da Vinci 5. A quick check on your market this morning. S&P 500 futures a little bit stronger. We have the ba latest Bank of America flow show saying that there are signs that the Trump trade is gaining traction. Since the beginning of October, Goldman's baskets of stocks to outperform on a Republican victory has decisively overtaken the Democrat peer. Michael Hartnett writing that odds tilting towards Trump winning the presidency has investors redoing the 2016 playbook that they are front running the 2016 moves. And that means banks small cap stocks and dollar are all surging higher. Your 10-year yields back at 4.1% this morning. Okay, that is it for Bloomberg Brief on this Friday morning. Surveillance will take it from here. This is Bloomberg.